So thank you everyone for joining us at the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University for our webinar series, Impact Insights. My name is Nola Wanta and I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy for the College of Business Administration. We're so pleased to have you join us as we discuss how businesses are navigating the changing landscape as a result of the COVID pandemic. Before I go on, um, I know there's a number of you that are starting to join us, but I do want to launch a poll. So hopefully as you come on, you'll be able to see our poll um, as it relates to our upcoming presentation with Professor Ensher and um, Ms. Hodo. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch polling. And as, um, as I go through and introduce our speakers, please do fill out the poll and it's gonna stay up for, for, you know, for those of you who are here and also for those who are coming in. So, um, you know, we are dedicated at the College of Business Administrations to bringing you valuable insights and doing our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and beyond. This series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the Los Angeles and global community. But before we get started, in addition to the polls, I'd like to just um, go quickly over some of our guidelines for today's webinar. Um, so, uh, as most of you can see, there should be a Q&A option there where you can type in your questions, which we will moderate um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, please use the chat window to post your comments only uh, for the panelists. Also, uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll leave some time for some interactive Q&A. So if you choose, raise your hand and we will unmute you. And just as a friendly reminder, this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available later. So we are pleased to have our very own management professor, Ellen Ensher, and, and Hilary Hodos, founder of uh, HIL Training, to talk to us about breaking up with bad breakouts. Um, I'm honored to introduce these two wonderful trailblazers who are paving the way and discussing how we can effectively use breakout rooms to deepen connections and learning in the virtual space. Uh, Professor Ensher is one of our management faculty who is an expert in mentoring. Uh, she is also a TED Talk speaker, a LinkedIn, and a LinkedIn learning author. Uh, she has also won numerous teaching awards, including the prestigious uh, LMU Professor of the Year Award. And she is highly sought after as a speaker in leadership. Um, Hilary Hodos is the founder of HIL Training, which focuses on using the basic tenets of improvisational theater to develop critical interpersonal and communication skills within organizations, which of course leads to more creative, inclusive, and engaged environments. She has spoken in many conferences and trainings. We were so happy to have Hillary and Professor Enter here uh, to discuss strategies and how we can engage um, either our students, our employees, and so forth in using breakout rooms. So Ellen and Hillary, over to you. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nola. I really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We're gonna be talking about a topic that's um, definitely near and dear to our hearts as we've been uh, working more and more with online breakout rooms. And we, uh, Ellen and I have been working on uh, tips to help improve your online breakout rooms. And we affectionately call it uh, breaking up with bad breakout. So we want to make sure that those breakout room experiences are as, as positive and productive as possible. Um, as, uh, as we heard um, in our introduction, I'm the founder of Hill Training. I work with companies, uh, numerous companies on interpersonal and communication skills. And it's just a love of mine. And I'm so excited to share some of those techniques and how we can bring them to the breakout rooms. And Ellen, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. So as Nola already provided a warm introduction, I've been a professor at LMU for 23 years and Elizabeth and I have partnered together over the years. In fact, um, this workshop is based on a forthcoming article which will be published in Training Magazine in November. So if anyone would like an advanced copy, please not to be shared, but if, you, if this whets your appetite and you'd like an advanced copy, we'll provide that to Nola as well. All right, Nola, next slide. I should just say, Nola, hit it. <laughs> we'll, go. we'll be like, Nola, hit it. Oh, perfect. So today in our overview, we're just gonna be going through exactly what are online breakout rooms, um, pitfalls that we've been finding as this becomes 
our new normal and part of our everyday work experience, what are things that we're finding, um, preforming, getting started, and then we're going to look at the breakout rooms, going into some checklists and really practical things that you can take back, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. All right, and Nola, hit it. Next slide. Okay, so um, actually, Nola, do you have the results of the poll that we just took? I'd love to uh, see if we can publish them to everyone to see exactly um, how many of us uh, have actually used online breakout rooms. Yes, I am sharing the results now. So oh, great. Okay, so we've got some veterans in the room. I love this. This is fantastic. All right, so just a little background since you have used them. I'll be very brief about what they are because you are a little bit more familiar. Um, but essentially, online breakout rooms are allow the facilitator to dissect the larger group into smaller groups that in, they are put into private rooms. So in these private rooms, uh, participants can collaborate together um, if it's on assignments, if it's on a case study, if it's on any sort of training activity, or even just the general getting to know you, it allows you to have a more intimate space to have that happen. Um, you as a facilitator can jump into these different rooms. However, participants cannot jump into other rooms. Um, when they are ready to come back, they are able to go back into the main interface. Um, because we're using online breakout rooms more and more, um, we're starting to see some common uh, experiences, some varied experiences, and we are starting to find some of the pitfalls. And I'm going to turn it over to Ellen to talk a little bit about the pitfalls that we're finding. So, Nolan, next slide. Thank you. So, there is a saying that all research is me search. So, the idea is a lot of times we start to write an article or do a webinar like this because it comes out of a, a place of pain and vulnerability. So when we did the pivot um, in March, of course, and when Elizabeth immediately started pivoting with her clients, she was working with a sales training organization, of course we were all seeking engagement, right? And one of the ways to engage is breakout rooms. Well, I have to say, quite different than doing a breakout room face-to-face. Face-to-face, we can use our superpowers of facilitation. We have the ability to read a room, hear one group, see another group simultaneously, make changes on the spot, read energy by glancing across the room. So there's a diminished ability to multitask and use your intuition. And I have to admit, in the beginning, when I started using breakout rooms, it, would, it was kind of like this sort of thing. Button, but oh, how it worked. Oh, oh, thank God. I don't know what they're doing in there, but thank God they're off my screen. So that happened, and I knew we can do better. I can do better. We can all do better. And I thought, if this is a pain point for Elizabeth and I, who are quite experienced, surely it's a pain point for others. Um, another aspect of the pitfall is the less control and accountability. So one of the things that I found with the breakout rooms is that people will go into the breakout rooms and they would use that to take a break. Oh, it's a great time to go get some coffee. Or they would use that as a chance to complain or they would just uh, waste time. I, you know, a lot of times people get into a breakout room and they have that moment where they look at each other like a deer in the headlights and say, what do we do? What'd she say? Uh, what are the instructions? So that takes a while to sort out. And then what, what we both found working with clients and with students is just such a variable quality in the group reporting out. So we'd come back, we'd start our large group debrief. And of course, there would be the general shifting of you talk, no, you talk, no, you talk. And then uh, once we figured out who was talking, then the the quality and the and the tenor of the conversation was was quite inconsistent. So we decided next slide. There's got to be a better way. And so our better way is to, is to add something we call preforming. So so um, if you think for a moment about the origin of group or team development, um, and think about our good old friend. Tuckman from 1965. It's kind of one of those models that I think is, is something that is fairly intuitive and most of us can recite by heart. Forming, storming, norming, performing, mourning, adjourning. So there's things that groups do. And we were thinking about it and we realized, wow, there needs to be a pre-forming stage that goes on top of forming. 
um, there's a whole lot that needs to happen before you even get them into a breakout room. So the first thing is probably something we're all doing, uh, but up top before they even go into that breakout room, have people do a quick introduction. And so if I have 30 in a room, I can't allow 30 minutes. It's gotta be 10 seconds. So a quick one for me, I'll probably do Monday is, tell us your name and a lot of us are going grocery shopping these days. What's an, if you were a grocery shop, grocery store item, what would you be? I like to say I would be guacamole because um, most people love guacamole, but for some people I'm a little too spicy. So do some kind of introduction. Then you want to, you want to definitely do some more time on ground rules, having an upfront contract, just as Nola did in the beginning in terms of the ground rules. I'm going to go um, quite a bit deeper. I did some TikTok videos, be happy to share those. And those are all about norms and expectations for being in an online workshop. And then the last thing, um, is before we get them into breakout rooms, we're gonna take them through a breakout assignment. So let's say the assignment is apply um, five stages of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're gonna walk them through. So that way it will eliminate that awkward, um, what are we doing kind of sensation. So we're suggesting more upfront or preforming. So Elizabeth, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And I think we need next slide. Awesome. So that's uh, getting started, like what we need to do before. Um, and there's a lot that actually is going to happen in the breakout room once we get there. Um, so I wanna walk you through just some tips to help those breakout rooms run really smooth and really effective. So first of all, um, I actually took uh, a webinar from Zoom and they were talking about breakouts and there was about 2000 people on this webinar and they started with the same poll I did how many people have actually used this? Uh, and actually, it was quite the opposite of what we, we just experienced, uh, where 68% of the people that polled in had never been in an online breakout room, which was really surprising because we've started to use these more and more, but 68% of them have not. And that tells me while we're still, while this is becoming more and more the norm, people still don't have a comfort level yet in the breakout rooms to make this an area where we don't need to actually do a warm up. So because this is a new environment, we wanna make sure that we're warming up the participants or our students in the breakout rooms. And when I say warm up, this is a little bit different than an icebreaker. When I'm talking about a warm up, we wanna do an activity that's gonna warm up the muscles and provide a comfort level in the room so that people will be able to come in when they're actually doing an assignment and feel more effective, more comfortable with this um, new environment and more aware of how those works, uh, how that works. So in this warm up, we want to actually practice the skills we're going to be using. So I'll go into some examples in just a little bit, but really think about it. If you have like a brainstorming session you're doing, maybe you want to work on active listening or support. Uh, if you have a small group assignment, we're going to need to have harder conversations. Maybe you want to talk about how do we have those supportive conversations or do a warm up aligned to that, but putting them into the breakout room first and allowing them to warm up on a similar activity, but in a low stakes way, absolutely provides them a little bit more comfort. So they will be more successful when they go into the environment to actually work on the assignment. So you wanna make sure that you have that first warm up to give people, just get people used to that interface and used to being brought back into the main room after they. It's almost like a shell shocked experience where you're like, oh, I was just there, now I'm here, and how's this all working? So give them that opportunity to succeed and set yourself up for success. The next thing that we want to make sure that we're doing, even prior to getting into the breakout room, is de defining roles and responsibilities. This is probably the number one time suck that we see in breakout rooms, is everyone comes in and everyone <laughs> all, the, all of a sudden starts to be like, okay, well, what are we doing? Uh, okay, who's going to do what? What are the different roles? What do we have to do in this assignment? What's going to happen? Um, and we want to take that guesswork off the, uh, off the, off the uh, we just want to take that uh, guesswork off the page. We don't want people to spend time guessing what they have to do and what those responsibilities are. So by defining those roles and responsibilities and then putting it into the shared document, which I'll talk about in just a second, helps people understand exactly what they're going to be doing. And there's a really simple way to do this. So let's say um, two common thing, uh, two common roles in a team are, um, you know, your facilitator and your note taker. So when we have our facilitator role, uh, maybe we'll give that a number one. And maybe we'll give our note taker a number two. 
And we can just even use the alphabet. We can say, okay, the letter A. So maybe Amy. Amy starts as the facilitator. And then maybe this time Brian is the note taker. Uh, and then all the way down the alphabet until all the roles and responsibilities are divvied up. Now, in subsequent breakout rooms, maybe Amy then moves to the bottom of the alphabet and she'll start to take the, the last or the, like if it's number five, she'll pick number five. Maybe Brian moves up to be the facilitator. So you can have a system in place where people know exactly what they're gonna be doing and then also are able to try on the different roles and responsibilities in that breakout room. Now next, that we wanna make sure we have prepared for the breakout room is a shared document. I'm gonna call this right now a worksheet. So on that worksheet, make sure that you have the roles and responsibilities with the numbers up at the top, and then a detailed outline of the instructions. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a breakout room and everyone's like, wait a minute, what are we doing? <laughs> and then everyone's like, I'm not so sure. And then you not only you have to take time to look at what the roles and responsibilities are, but now you're actually taking time to be like, okay, well, let's recap what the directions are as opposed to jumping into the assignment or into the task at hand. So you wanna make sure you have both the roles and responsibilities outlined on that shared document, and then detailed instructions. And then a, if it's um, anything they need to fill out, so if it's a chart, a table, whatever they're going to be working on, have that on that document or on that worksheet so that they can easily fill and follow that flow. That way you're going to have each group have a, have a more effective report out and you'll, you'll level up with that consistency. And the reason I also say a shared document is there's a, there's a kind of a trick of the trade right now that we can use. If you're working on a shared document, let's say it's a Google Doc, uh, you can share that document with the group. Uh, so if it's group one, two, and three, you'll share a, a document for group one, two, and three, et cetera. Uh, and then you actually, as the facilitator, can monitor the notes that are, becoming, that are coming into that document in real time. So if someone in group one is you know, not taking notes or it's very minimal notes and it seems to be taking them a while, while group two is just like knocking it out of the park, they're getting started, they're writing everything, you can then monitor. So if you think about it in the in-person experience, you can kind of hover and see what groups are struggling or which ones are doing well um, and you correct quickly. This is the way we can do this in the online breakout room through the shared document. So you'll be able to then say, oh, they're not taking as many notes. Maybe I, as a facilitator, need to jump into that room and check on them, see if there's something I can course correct, to make sure that they have just as an equal experience as the other groups. And then when we talk about that report out, when we're back into the main room, that will be more consistent across the board. Okay, uh, so next slide. So I want to give you a checklist. This is just a really practical, uh, Ellen and I work together to define kind of the five major roles that you're going to have in your breakout rooms or in the teams. And this is what we have um, that you can just use to put right into your document. So you have your facilitator. Um, that's just recapping your direction and resolving some of the conflict that's going to come in. You have your note taker, pretty self-explanatory, they'll work in the shared document. The presenter, that person who's going to report out. The timekeeper that helps everyone stay on track uh, and then also make sure we don't get on too many sidetracks and um, too many distractions or um, off topics. So that time people were, will be able to say, hey, we have five more minutes left. And also we're going off on this tangent, let's bring it back. And then lastly, I wanted to spend a little bit more time on this. It's the apologist. So the apologist offers alternative perspectives and defends the lesser accepted idea. So let's say uh, you have a group that's working together and someone mentioned a, uh, a comment and then someone accidentally talked over them, which never happens online or on a conference call. Um, happens all the time. Uh, so when that happens, maybe the idea that person presented just got glossed over. Um, the apologist can then say, okay, um, actually I heard this idea mentioned. Can we quickly explore this first before moving on to other ideas? And this is a key way to make sure that all voices are heard in this environment and to make sure that we're creating that inclusive team even in this capacity which is at the heart of what we want in each group to make sure all of the voices are heard. And that's really the role of the apologist, which is why it's so critical. Okay, now the next one. Next slide. Thanks, Nola. Hit it, Nola. Um, all right, so we have, I know I mentioned warm-ups. So warm-ups in the breakout room, giving people a chance to feel comfortable and set themselves up for success when you're doing other projects. Here's a couple of activities that I have and we'll have more um, that's in the article, or if you even need more, you can even message me, um, and we'll, I'm more than happy to kind of help or talk you through some of these. Um, but 
one of the exercises you can do, let's say active listening is a big part of a group assignment that you're having coming up and you wanna give them an active listening exercises, exercise to warm up in the breakout room. Uh, this activity is called count up. So the whole group comes together and they can even turn off their video cameras for a second. They'll turn off their video cameras or they'll close their eyes. And then they're going to try to count to 20. So one at a time as a group, count up to 20. Now, anytime someone speaks over another person, anytime numbers start to go in, if someone says one, two, three, four, five, anytime a pattern emerges, you have to go back down to one. So anytime that happens, again, back down to one. Anytime you decide, oh, I'm gonna go after Ellen, um, I have to go back to one. So it's a really good way to make sure that we're perking up our listening skills. And this is a, another really good way to get that group working together as a unit and talking. Um, it always makes everyone laugh. And then when everyone gets to 20, everyone celebrates together. So it's a really nice way to bond that team as well as warm up for uh, that muscle that might be critical later. The next one I have is on vacation. So this is a great building exercise. So if you have a uh, brainstorm session, on vacation is a nice one because everyone, we all think about our vacations. We all have a dream of vacation um, in mind. I know I do. Uh, so we can talk about building our dream vacation. So you'd start by saying that you'd pair them up in the breakout room. So, or in that breakout room, one person would start by saying, when I go on vacation, I'm going to, let's say, I don't know, uh, Toronto. Sure, apparently Toronto is my dream vacation right now. Um, so they'll say, when I go on vacation, I'm going to Toronto. The next person in the breakout room would then say, when I'm going on vacation, I'm going to Toronto and I'm going to visit a museum. And then the next person in the breakout room would just add. So you keep on adding until you probably get to about 10 or 12 items. And then you allow um, people to kind of celebrate the fact that they got through it and did it. And it's a really nice way to get people again listening and also building up each other's ideas. And it does work really well in these breakout rooms. Okay, awesome. So uh, next one. So with that, we wanna make sure that we give time to open up for the Q&A. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. I'm just going to pull up our Q&A. So just a reminder for everyone, um, you know, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A um, box and we're happy to moderate them. Um, we also have our navigator, Patty, who is monitoring hand raises. So um, if anyone uh, raises their hand and would like to speak to our speakers, uh, that would be great. I do have a question from George. Um, I want to use pre-assigned breakout rooms and I've created a CSV file and uploaded it. How do I check the groups and group members before the breakout rooms are released? I just want to check before I release the groups. Yeah. I just, I think, George, can you clarify the question? I want to make sure I fully understand. Okay. It's okay if you're on mute, George, if you take yourself off. I just want to dig in a little bit here. Yeah. and. Um, Patty, you may have to unmute George on your end. Can you raise your hand, George? Ah, there we go. George. Hi, George. <laughs> Hi, George. Hi. <laughs> Can people hear me now? Yeah. My son is a very proud graduate of Alameda, so I'm happy. Mm -hmm. to um, okay, so I'm I teach at UCLA, and we uh, we use a lot of breakout rooms. Uh, but it's, it's been the case sometimes that uh, when you upload these CSV files and then you do the breakout rooms, <coughs> um, people don't end up in the rooms they, that they were assigned to. And that's because the email addresses are sometimes out of whack. Yeah. So is there a way to check the, e the email addresses that are, let's say, in an in a enrollment file with what students type in when they join their, when they join their groups? Because there's been a mismatch of students to, to break our rooms, in my experience, when you get like 30, 40 people in a room. Got it. So is the question, George, um, you're looking at how do you align the emails um, to, together to make sure that the right people get in the right breakout room? Is that right? Is there, some, is, it, is there some kind of reporting I can check immediately before the breakout rooms are released? Mm -hmm. Because what um, happens now is I've got, let's say, 10 breakout rooms, four people in a room. And six or seven will be stranded in the main room because they they didn't have the right pointer to their breakout room. That feels more like an 
a tech IT question. I mean, I would say maybe what you want to do is pre-assign breakout rooms um, and then that and before you even set them to task. And then that way you can make sure that they're all in the proper rooms that they're supposed to be in. Yeah, well, I, I did that. And, okay. and okay, so th there may be a tech problem. It may be a student cockpit error or my problem, but you know, getting 35 yeah. out of 40 into their right break arm seems okay. But I always have this stragglers of five or six that don't make it. It's very irritating to them and to me. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's learning the new technology for sure. I think that, yeah, I will echo Ellen. I think that would be more of a, a tech question for um, the Zoom breakout people uh, to help you with, uh, to make sure that they get all of that aligned for you on the backing. But yeah, I, I can take it, you, you folks haven't run into that then. I have had, yeah, I have had stragglers. And so then what I'll do is I'll just uh, stick them manually in a group. Okay. Um, I, I also think. Uh, George, we have these, you know, fabulous navigators. So the more that you can have someone playing that role of a navigator, uh, so we can focus on facilitation, that's also really, really helpful. Love our navigators. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks George. So um, we do have a question from Jeffrey here. Um, is there a way for the host to communicate to the breakout rooms via the chat? Yes, you can send messages. I know I have sent messages saying you have this amount of time, you have that amount of time left. So you can compose a longer message to people while they're in the rooms. I personally like to just zoom on in and go and visit them. And, the, and this is, again, where if you have someone else, and what I'm kind of thinking about doing is I'm thinking about, once I know the students, I'm gonna do a survey and I figure out who's interested in things like HR and facilitation. I'm, I'm going to also have them help as well as the navigator. But I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Elizabeth, do you wanna add or change? Um, yes, no, you can, you can absolutely send a note to all of the groups. Uh, I think it's, uh, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head, I think it's like to all participants. Um, and then you'll be able to send out a longer message. I've done that uh, just to like do quick reminders. So, hey, remind, remind you to make sure you're getting, capturing this and this information. So you can absolutely do that. Um, I also have done the same thing as Ellen. I'll jump into the rooms just to check on people as well or echo a message. Um, if I need it, especially if I'm working or seeing in the shared document uh, that, you know, maybe a group is off track a little bit, that tells me like, oh, I'm going to go into that room. Or if I'm seeing it across the board, I'll also use that shared document to do a quick memo to everyone to say, hey, this is happening. Yeah, shared document is key. Yeah, for sure. Great. Um, so we do have a question from our Dean, Dale. Um, we are all becoming familiar with Zoom fatigue. Do you see breakout rooms fatigue as a thing? Um, and if so, what strategies can be used to continue to engage so that breakouts don't become just some same old, same old routinized adding to fatigue? We want this to keep this continuously engaging and exciting. Right. So that is a great question. So I would say, first of all, one thing I realized that we forgot to say is before you send people into breakout rooms, give them a little break because chances are they're gonna take a break anyway once they get there. So I think the best thing to do is say, we're gonna take a break, we're gonna come back, then go into breakout rooms. The other thing I've been attending all sorts of sessions this summer is have them do something physical. So I had a facilitator who had us walk around the room and touch walls, um, pick up something on your desk and hold it up, or even just leading a quick stretch um, as well. So I think, I think you're right. It's like, it's a tool like anything else. So we have to keep surprising them. Uh, one thing I'm going to do this semester is I did a post on LinkedIn and I asked people to come in and be Zoom bombers for me. So I have a whole roster of professionals. So one, for example, I'm going to have a friend who's a works at Postmates corporate and the doorbell's going to ring 
ding dong. <laughs> I go, oh, you guys, my Postmates is here. Then Lizzie's going to zoom in from Postmates and give a 10 minute talk about what what it's like to work for a tech company. So I think the whole thing with the Zoom rooms and everything is surprise, even if it's cheesy. It's like, we, you know what? We can't teach them anything unless we keep them awake. So that's our number one job, keep them awake. I agree. And I think this is a really good, I, I love exactly that because I think that's also why we wanna do those kind of engaging warmups. And the warmups that I mentioned are based on improv games. So improvisational theater. So like the, you know, if you think about it, some of them are like, whose line is it anyway? Things like that. Um, those games are so fun for people to do. And it really breaks up the monotony that can become the Zoom life, uh, where you're constantly in that same type of rhythm. So if you take some of those warm up ideas and to Ellen's point, you surprise them and allow them to be fun and spontaneous and work in a different way. It frees up your mind. It takes away some of that fatigue because we all are getting it. I mean, me, myself included. Uh, and so when we can do those type of warmups or those type of varied exercises, I also encourage people throughout their um, course or throughout their training to vary up the types of activities you do in the breakout room. So maybe you have a, a, a case study that you're doing, but maybe also um, you're having them work on something different, something has a different energy or flow. Um, and maybe it's just a quick, um, you know, short answer thing that they're writing. Who, who knows? As long as it's a little different, I think you're gonna you're gonna help lo loosen some of that fatigue. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Mark Hattendorf. Hello, Professor. Um, how are students assigned quickly to particular groups? I just do the Zoom random sort. Yeah, it, just the tool in Zoom. I'll, do you do anything different, Elizabeth? Um, I do both. I do the random sort and I also do, um, just to George Port, kind of what he was doing too, where he assigns and he breaks out uh, people into group, groups. I do like the random uh, and one of the reasons, a lot of the work that I do um, it actually involves breaking down silos and getting people to work with each other across different departments in an organization. Um, but even students in the classroom, I think it's really important for people to break down some of those silos. So being able to randomly put people in groups um, is really a, an exciting way to um, meet more of the people in your classroom and have more of a shared experience um, and make this, uh, uh, and really make this uh, environment come alive. So I, I do both and I think it just depends on your use case. Um, if it's like a team project they're working on together, absolutely put them together in a group in the breakout room. Uh, but if it's something that you can work with different people, I absolutely encourage that because I think that's a great way for people to meet everyone in the classroom. Fantastic. Just a quick comment from George, and I know George from UCLA too. Hi, George. Um, he says, if I may, um, I address Zoom fatigue with competitions and polling with Poll Everywhere, which is now available at LMU as well, and not Zoom polling, and it works great. Yes, it's very true. And so we do have a question from Lynn. Um, my question is about the use of the shared document as a hovering device. With so many groups contributing simultaneously to the shared document, I find that the document can become unwieldy. Do you advise setting up the shared document in a particular way to organize contributions, or do you suggest providing a blank talk document for more free thinking? Thank you. Yeah, so I absolutely am more prescriptive with my shared document because that's exactly the problem. It, it can get unwieldy, and there's a lot of input coming in. So it does become a muscle you get a little bit used to after a while. It's like, okay, um, I have a lot of input that I'm receiving and you know, I wanna spend time on here, but I, I'm more cursory with it. I use it as just a check-in to see if there's anywhere I need to jump into um, and problem solve versus um, really dive in deep to the content they're discussing. And honestly, it's just because of the time constraints that we had, I would love to go deeper into the document, but I don't have that. So I'm very prescriptive if it's, um, if they're working on an activity, uh, let's say for, if it's you know outlining Maslow's hierarchy and they're working together in a group outlining different parts of that, uh, you know, I would absolutely put everything that you want them to discuss and like every part that you want them to fill out prescriptive on that sheet. Now, there is another use case for this. Let's say if it is a creative problem solving or if it's a brainstorming session, um, which I do a lot with my clients, I will absolutely give them free reign. I will give them a topic. I will give them bullets that they'll probably want to hit, but then I will give them that document to be more free with. I think it really does depend. 
I, well, let me say this. I do err on the side of more caution and giving them more prescriptive um, outlines because I think you have better and more consistent results. But if it is a brainstorming session or something that requires more creative thinking or more, um, you know, more loose thinking, I, I, you could just, you could just give them the blind craft. Ellen, anything to add to that? No, I, I think I was just thinking though, I was just reflecting on a morning, this morning, um, I was at a meeting, all faculty, and we're very collegial, but I was thinking if there was one takeaway from this was the pre-assigning roles and responsibilities because uh, we had a very, you know, we did a lot of hot potato, like, Carla, you speak. No, Ellen, you speak. Who's taking notes? I don't want to take notes. Maybe you could take notes. And I was internally laughing, thinking how much time even those of us who do this for a living spend. So I think if there is one takeaway, pre-assigning those roles. And then what a wonderful thing this is going to be because we're all going to get a lot more skilled at the various roles. And, you know, some are going to stretch people out of their comfort zone because it's not something they're used to. They're, they're, it's, it's a way of being in a group that they haven't done before necessarily. Yeah, I love that point, Ellen. I absolutely want to add on to that point too. And I think that's why when we talk about the upfront contract um, at the top of uh, our class or our training session, whatever that may be, um, making sure that everyone has that accepted roles of behavior, not to judge someone who's trying something new um, and to make sure we're supporting each other. Because to Ellen's point, we're going to be trying on different roles. We're going to be in this together. This is absolutely a newer um, feature that we're all working with and allowing people to have a safe space experience and try new things, I think is critical. Right. Um, and, I, you know, I'm just, sorry, but I, I, love, I wish I could see people, but I also just think that we are in a time in our country where it's so hard for people to even know the rules of engagement for civil discourse. So this gives them, and, and yet that's a skill that we need, especially in education. We have to talk about things that are difficult or how will we learn. So I think um, giving them those roles and really digging in, I think it's really comes down to spending more time on process than maybe we have before. Absolutely. And, and thank you for that. And, and please, just a reminder to everyone to type in your questions as they come to you and we'll you know, continue the conversation. Um, I do have a question, uh, just, and maybe I may have missed this and I apologize, but in terms of roles and responsibilities, is it the, the team within the team that, or the breakout that they choose the roles or is that pre-assigned already? So it's pre-assigned. Pre-assigned. So what we were in, what we were thinking about, um, and we've done is we give them, we assign each role a number and then once they get in the group, it's not a choice. I'm going to be the facilitator. I'm going to be a scribe. It's what letter of the alphabet does your name start with? So we've got Amy, Abel, Atticus, that that's how we choose. So the first one's a one, two, three, four, five. And then, you know, let's say we do a second breakout room. We can rotate it. Um, so there's no choosing, you know, and probably as I'm thinking about it, one of the rules maybe is, you know, no swapping. You know, you get what you get. <laughs> You get what you get, you don't get upset. Yeah. Okay, I've been fixing far too many dinners for teenagers. <laughs> you get what you get. I love it. I think it's true because, uh, and to, uh, you know, Ellen, to your earlier point, one of the pitfalls that we were, were talking about is really, that's just wasted time. And I mean, in, to your point earlier, when even in the faculty meeting, you're like, oh, who's taking notes? Who's doing and we still do that. And it's really... Um, it's really funny because then we look at it and we're like, oh, okay, well, we, we know we can um, have a better system. And it, it's a little bit different um, from, you know, everyone kind of sitting together and, you know, being able to um, read body language or, you know, in that room where you can kind of help them navigate assigning roles. We just don't have the time and the luxury. We do have to be more procedural when we're in these kind of breakout rooms to make them really run smoothly. So there is a lot more work on the front end to do that. And by taking that roles and responsibilities, um, you know, and just making it really concrete, you're going to save yourself a lot of headache and a lot of discussion time that's not spent in the ideal way. Great, thank you. And actually, Rachel has a question and she read my mind. Do you recommend visiting breakout rooms to check in with the groups? 
If so, how do you do that without interrupt, interrupting the student conversation? If students are not talking as much, what is a good way to facilitate discussion in a breakout room? Yes, I definitely recommend just as if it was a real situation, I would walk the room, I would hover at the corners of groups. So I like to remind people that I am going to zoom in. And I think I just use humor because it is a little weird. So I, I usually do like a whoosh. Um, you know, like, I, look, I was just transported into your room. How's it going? So uh, it, just as a hi, how are you? And then I try to just shut my mouth. I don't want them necessarily to catch me up. Um, but I, I definitely give them a little warning, like, I'm here, I just arrived. And it, it is kind of weird and funny. Uh, so I try to acknowledge that, but 100% zoom in and go visit them. Um, and again, you know, thinking logistically, that's why it's important to do that break ahead of time because we as facilitators, like, we need breaks. We need to be able to catch our breath too. And I think that was a lesson I learned um, from last year is I would just go and go and go. And then sometimes once they got into breakout rooms, I was like, oh, thank goodness. So I building in that break before crucial. Yeah, I love that. I think this is, I think that's absolutely critical to build in that break. Um, and also when you're, when people are hesitant to participate, there's a lot of things that I do um, to make sure I can help get that participation going. One, um, I, you know, always back to that upfront contract, you are not being judged. We are absolutely in this together. We're doing this. Like anything you can do to remind them that it's a safe space to contribute. I actually, I was working with a team and um, by the end of it, I think I had to say that to them, probably every other sentence, I was like, you're not being judged, it's okay, we can do, you know, we'll get through. And they opened up and I actually had one, um, one of the participants who said, I didn't realize my opinion mattered that much. And I, I just didn't think it, I should share it. And it was such like, oh, that hit me. And just hearing that, knowing that I reiterated that how safe of an environment this is to make it a place where they can contribute is critical. I think that's absolutely one of the things you want to do and say and say again and say again and say again, because you'll see people open up that normally wouldn't open up. The second thing I would always recommend is to, to definitely get that warm up going. Um, make it a non stakes warm up in your first breakout room. So it kind of gets away some of those inhibitions. Like if you're counting to 20 and you're messing up and it's perfect that you're messing up because everyone's going to, and then you celebrate it together it gets people talking a little bit out of their head because we all get in our head and we're like, what's the right answer? What's the wrong answer? I'm going to be right. I'm going to be wrong. Or I'm going to make a fool of myself. And it just helps loosen some of that judgment and allows us to actually be present on what's going on right now and right here. And that's going to help you set up uh, success. So when you go into the breakout rooms, when you're working on assignment, uh, the likelihood that they'll be hesitant is, is lesser. It's, uh, is that a word? Lesser? Sure. It's lesser. <laughs> Uh, right now it is. Um, but it really does make them feel a little bit more comfortable. Now, if you get into the room and they're still not participating, um, I always have uh, prepared questions that I can ask to get the conversation started. So I'll, you know, I'll say, hey, we're going to round, round robin this. So if you're not familiar with round robin, everyone's going to take a turn. Um, there's no silly responses. Here's a question, you know, quick one word answer they can do. Um, but I just have a bank of questions handy in my, in my backpack and in my arsenal to make sure that if that does happen, if they are truly stuck, I can get that conversation going through good questioning and make sure that everyone has a chance to participate. So, so those are just a couple of techniques that I use when the conversation feels stilted. Wonderful, and I think your last comment ties into this next question. Um, any suggestions for making, for making sure quieter people are engaged and participate in the breakout assignment? I missed part of that. Any suggestions oh, for? Making sure quieter people um, are engaged and participate in the breakout assignment. Yes. Yeah. I, I personally am a firm believer in round robin, and I think that's actually a role that the facilitator can really play. Um, so everyone has a chance to go before um, someone else can share. Um, I've used this technique in, tra in this technique in training, and when I say it absolutely works, and even the I'll, I'll reference the count up exercise. In the count up exercise, what ends up happening in the exercise exercise is you're, you have this kind of this next level awareness. They're like, oh, 
Ellen hasn't contributed in a minute. She's probably going to go next. I'm not going to say anything because she's going to go next. And I'm going to hold back until she goes because I can be aware that that's not happening, uh, that she hasn't participated. So by doing a warm up like that, it gets everyone participating first. But then round robin to start really does make sure that even the quieter people um, have a chance to uh, you know, share and are brought into the conversation and doing so in a supported, friendly way. Never, we're not calling people out on the carpet. We're not, I, I feel like that's a very Michigan thing for me to say, calling people out on the carpet. <laughs> it's probably not an expression, but putting people on the spot, that's the expression. Um, but putting people on the spot, um, you're creating that safe environment through that upfront contract to make sure that everyone feels taken care of. So someone who is quieter, who may not um, want to share as much, that's okay. You can also have people write down answers. So you can give them um, questions before the breakout room and while they're on their break, they can digest and think about those questions. And when they go to the breakout room, they'll feel more prepared. So that's another technique. If you feel like you really have a group that is a little bit more hesitant or does need more time, which absolutely, it, there's nothing wrong with it. That's fantastic because it tells you that they're very good at thinking things through, giving them that time even before the breakout room to digest the information. Um, I also, that's, that's perfect, Elizabeth. I'm going to add on a little bit. This would pertain more to I, either a class or a workshop that's ongoing. It doesn't really pertain to a one-off workshop, so caveat there. So let's assume it's an ongoing workshop or class. Um, I am, one of the like upsides that I noticed last semester once we switched over is that my quieter students on the discussion boards were so much more vocal. And that was such a lovely way to bring everyone in. So I, I am thinking in, about doing the discussion board and then you're able to reference that. So for example, I had some great guest speakers. First time I brought them in, crickets. Second time, posted on the discussion board, had people write questions. And then I was able to call out and say, oh, Patty, I know you had a great question that you mentioned in the discussion board. You know, Nola, tell us more. So I could see using that as a way to prep the Zoom breakout rooms as well. Oh, I love that. I'm stealing that, Ellen. <laughs> I love that. Go for it. <laughs> um, again, everyone, please feel free to type in your questions. Um, so I, I do have one other question because um, I'm experiencing this as well as we plan for a graduate orientation, which is happening on Friday and Saturday. So pre-planning, as you're mentioning, um, is, is really, really important. Can the both of you tell us about a situation where you know you, you thought you had everything planned out <laughs> for the <laughs> break rooms and so forth, and <laughs> yeah. it went completely unexpectedly, either positively or negatively, um, yeah, about a time that, that you know, you, pre, you thought you pre-planned -plan so well, but X, so. Gosh, <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that is certain, I can think of so many examples face-to-face -face and with breakout rooms. I mean, I think for me, one of my most poignant memories is doing that TEDx talk, so there may be I don't know, 300, 500 people there. And you don't see this on the video, but three minutes in my talk, um, the audio dropped. And so the host had to come get me. I had to walk off stage and I had to start the whole thing over. And I wanted to curse and cry, and which is my go-to response. But instead, I pretended like I was somebody who actually had some grace and poise <laughs> and uh, I just said, well, I didn't visualize that, you know, I'm human, let's do it again. And I think really allowing your participants to see that you're human, you're taking a shot, but you're not falling apart. Um, unfortunately, I think we all get presented with a lot of opportunities to show that grace under pressure. So, and I mean, that's part of this too. I mean, I know we've both tried things in the breakout rooms and they didn't work and, and, they get to see that we fail also, which is, which is part of being a good facilitator. You have to try things and they're not always gonna work. Oh, it's so true. Especially uh, a lot of what I do is interpersonal and communication skills training. 
And so a lot of the workshops I did, I've done, I had done online trainings um, as well as in person, but absolutely I did more in-person training than online training. And now it's obviously 100% different. And so uh, when I was starting to work on interpersonal and communication skills training, I've had to use breakout rooms because you have to dissect the larger group into small groups or it just doesn't work. Um, you know, if you can pair them off or if you can put them in groups of three or four, whatever you have to do, you have to do that. Um, and I, when I was first learning the system, I, I couldn't actually get them into the breakout rooms. So I kept trying to, you know, put them into breakout rooms, but the, it just, the system crashed, it didn't work. Um, so what we ended up doing is uh, we ended up actually doing kind of a, uh, you know, we kind of took turns on the larger group. But what I learned was that I needed to practice the production element of my Zooms prior to doing them. So I thought, oh, I've practiced, I did a run through of my content, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, <laughs> it is absolutely not. Um, and unfortunately I learned that the hard way and now I absolutely do, instead of just a content run through, I do a production run through. And that's like, I'm going to, you know, I will get guinea pigs. I actually use my husband and I'm like, you're gonna be in this. And I'm gonna put you into that room and I'm gonna do this and you tell me how that works. Um, and he, he plays along with me. He, he just like, okay, I'll go, I'll do that. Um, but do a production run through. Um, do that moment of like putting them into the breakout rooms, assigning them, um, chatting to them. Try all of the things that you're going to need to do before you get into the breakout room. That's wonderful. And that's exactly what we'll be doing in, over the next few days. Um, another question for George. Do you find that recording Zoom sessions will inhibit participation? Yes. A little bit. It is what it is. I mean, I definitely noticed that with some of my guest speakers. I feel like when people are in the room, they're very personal, they're very vulnerable. And I, you know, I was very clear this is being recorded. I, I think it does inhibit it a bit, but I think if you also establish, you know, we have that, you know, as a group, we've decided we are not sharing this. This is, you know, the Vegas rules, what happens here stays here. You know, it's really about building that trust. Um, but absolutely, absolutely. I think it's a reality of what the situation is. And that's okay as long as we're just aware of it. I know it, and, and you know, I know it definitely inhibits me. I tend to be a little bit irreverent sometimes just because I do want to keep people awake. And I've, I had to think to myself, "Ooh, I'm recording. Let me tamp that down a little bit." And, you know, maybe that's maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm absolutely the same way. I I, I get nervous when I'm um, being recorded, and I get recorded, and I still am like, "Okay, this is going on file somewhere. Someone's going to get a hold of this, and it's going to get out." And I'm like, "What is it getting out to?" It's fine, but it is it is a little bit of a different piece when you are being recorded. There there is a wall that kind of starts to go up, and I think it's. Um, depending on your use case for recording, um, I try to use it as minimally as possible uh, just to make sure that people are comfortable and that no one gets that wall or doesn't want to contribute because they're afraid of maybe having a record of something not going right. Um, we have a question here from uh, Professor Delante. Uh, to help build community early in the semester, can you share your favorite icebreakers that help students build common ground? I'm looking for fun things or even controversial that might address personal work or school experiences or current events like COVID, demonstrations, music, fashion. Um, I, like, I like your idea of build an, an ideal vacation exercise, but do you have any other favorite icebreakers that you could share? I do. Oh my gosh. Um, it's like, oh, there's, I mean, there's so many. Uh, I love that you said controversial and I've got a controversial one. Ellen, dare I? I'll do a controversial one. Do it, do it. Um, Wait, are we being recorded? We're, we're <laughs> being recorded and I'm giving a controversial. I actually yeah. did uh, this exercise at uh, Chicago Ideas Week uh, and this was uh, in, at the biggest mistake night. And so they brought me in to do an exercise uh, with the whole group. I think, I think they were like, three or 400 people in the room. And uh, they wanted me to come in and do an exercise with everyone around a biggest mistake. And so I came, I came up with this exercise to do kind of an icebreaker for the room that was called Hold My Drink. And um, this exercise, uh, they would start off, the first person would start off and the first person would say was, uh, would say something like, 
uh, I left the light on in the kitchen overnight. It's such a small mistake or something like that, but it's something they did and they're like, okay. And then the person next to them or the person you know, next on the alphabet, if this is a, a Zoom meeting, um, that they would say, hold my drink. And then this next person would say, um, I left the oven on, you know, when I went out to the grocery store. And then you could, uh, you could build, up, they built up the mistake until someone had the largest mistake that everyone agreed, yeah, that's the biggest mistake. And everyone cheered and celebrated. Um, but the point was, after that, they talked about what they learned from that mistake and, you know, what, what their takeaway was. And that actually got more conversations started than I've ever seen. And it was such a vulnerable place to be, but such an impactful place to be. And that's an exercise I love. Um, and that's the controversial one. So when you said controversial, I was like, I love this. Um, there's a couple others that you can absolutely do to get people talking. Um, one, if you have a session where let's say uh, you're talking where maybe people have to have disagreements or are discussing or dissecting an idea that there are maybe disagreements on, um, an exercise I love is called that's interesting because so you essentially have two people and um, you could say oh um, you know their favorite movie let's say so someone says their favorite movie and they say why you know let's say uh, their favorite movie was Chinatown because they love film noir um, their partner would then say um, that's interesting to me because I find it interesting for human behavior and my favorite movie is um, whatever their favorite movie is and they and then they uh, say why they think their favorite movie is the best movie now the next person is saying that's interesting to me because so you're never negating the person's point you're telling them what you found impactful about what they said and then adding on to um, adding on to their statement and also sharing your perspective from your movie or what that reminds you of so that's another way if you have let's say a session where um, you know you're going to have some debating going on in the classroom or in the training session that's a nice exercise to do as well um, the other, there's, oh gosh, um, there's a, there's a few others, but those are really good ones to just even get kind of started and you can tweak them as needed. Yeah. And, you know, to, it, for those who are on with LMU, Tony Cometti just sent me, uh, he's another professor, 21 great exercises. I can send them to you, Nola, if people are interested. Um, one, I think I'm going to do Monday is, um, head, shoulders, feet, where you have them draw a stick figure. I learned this through an alternative break. And it's a mix of um, silly and also more serious. So with your head, you know, what are you dreaming about? With your shoulders, what burdens do you carry? With your stomach, what's your, what's your favorite thing you like to put in your stomach? You know, with your right foot, where do you want to go next? With your left foot, where have you been? So that's one. I'm, I'm, I don't steal that spot. I'm using that one on Monday. <laughs> so um, so oh, I, there, oh, I'm sorry, Nola, can I add one more? Oh, um, yeah, sure. <laughs> you can go back and forth. We love icebreakers. Um, <laughs> so many just, uh, <laughs> there's another exercise. It's randomly called Green Beans. I don't know why it's called. Well, there's a song that goes along with it, but it's called Green Beans. And um, there's like a little chant with it. They're like, uh, it's like, I like green beans. Yeah. And then people say five things that they like. And then every time someone says something they like, everyone cheers. And then they say something else they like, everyone cheers. So if it's like, I like pizza. Yeah. I like pasta. Yeah. I'm really am hungry. Um, and so it's a way to support and also just open up conversation and get the energy going. Because you know, as facilitators, as teachers, um, you were always like looking for that energy and trying to drive that in the room. And this is a great way to get people moving physically, um, even in this type of environment that we're in right now. Oh, awesome. I love that. I'm stealing that one. Oh yeah, totally take it. Yeah, these are just really wonderful exercises to do in the virtual space. And I'm hoping, I feel like we should do another webinar on I just what other different types of activities because you know, this virtual interaction is real, right? And we're trying to figure out ways to, like Ellen, you said earlier in a meeting, to make it more fun. So how do we, how do, we do that? And how do we engage in each other and, and develop those deeper connections? Um, I really appreciate everyone joining us for our webinar for today. Um, you know, we are gonna be taking a bit of a break just to launch our fall semester, but we will be back on September 17th um, with another webinar on impact investing. So we're gonna pivot a bit to finance 
And so we hope that you'll be able to join us then. Uh, but otherwise, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for our, our webinar for today and for joining LMU. So have a great rest of your day. And thank you, everyone. And thank you to our speakers, Professor Ensher and Elizabeth. So wonderful.